All right. So thank you so much. Um, that was great. I'm so delighted to be here and spend a little time uh, talking about competing in the age of AI uh, with uh, probably one of the world's most interesting industries right now, if not the most interesting industries uh, in, uh, in an interesting time of uh, great digital transformation and, and all kinds of uh, crazy events. So um, it's an interesting time to talk about digital transformation. Uh, there's a lot going on, a lot of different things happening. Um, and, uh, but for us, the story begins a few years ago when we started thinking about uh, writing this book. Uh, Karim Lakani, my co-author, and I have worked together for many, many years. And we spent a bunch of time thinking about what this book really should be about, how to frame it, how to think about the overall themes and, and, and key takeaways. And for us, uh, we had this very interesting moment when we kind of got stuck on this uh, painting. Uh, this is uh, a pseudo Rembrandt. Uh, it looks like a Rembrandt. It fools a lot of uh, Rembrandt experts. Uh, it's uh, quite something to behold. And it's, uh, uh, of course, uh, been uh, done by uh, digital technology. So you have uh, a bunch of algorithms that have learned from existing Rembrandt paintings. They were scanned in three dimensions and uh, they created essentially a meta Rembrandt, a, the portrait of all portraits. This is not after any uh, individual human being, but it's fundamentally a general uh, uh, portrait of, uh, which is kind of like a superset uh, of all the Rembrandt paintings. Uh, it's super interesting and Karim and I, kept staring at this and staring at this. And it's like, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty unique and, and amazing and crazy and kind of disturbing. And, and um, our reaction uh, really went to uh, all kinds of ends of the spectrum. On one end, uh, lots of people and the two of us also were pretty impressed. Uh, this is uh, kind of amazing what you can do right now with uh, with AI and 3D printing. Uh, by the way, it's, the whole thing is 3D printed on like 40 plus layers of paint. So it actually is a three dimensional structure of the painting and everything. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And so lots of people really impressed by this. Lots of people really excited about this, but also a lot of people uh, really upset by this. Like how dare you take such a sacred thing as a genius like Rembrandt and replicate it uh, with a bunch of computers. And it's just this uh, fascinating things. In fact, I think most of our reactions are a combination of both. Um, my favorite one though is, is this article by uh, Jonathan Jones, who is an amazing art critic. And he basically rips it to shreds and talks about how one should not even have tried to do this. It's just not a uh, healthy, thing to go out and replicate the work of a genius. But after staring at it and staring at it, um, Karim and I finally figured out what was so interesting about this painting to us. And fundamentally, there is a great insight uh, in this, in that uh, it doesn't take a genius anymore to replicate and in some ways extend the work of a genius. That relatively very simple AI uh, is really changing the world and doing remarkable things. Um, yes, you have PhDs and AI and computer science, and you have all kinds of experts out there developing new things every day. But the reality is that AI is accessible to all of us. And uh, most significant firms are already investing in it. Uh, there's a lot of churn going on. A lot of us are doing this. And the relatively simple AI that has been deployed to do simple tasks is fundamentally changing the world. It's really changing the economy. In fact, one of the things that's probably most controversial about the book is our definition of artificial intelligence. Rather than thinking about AI as something that is you know, literally bigger than life, something that matches or even surpasses human intelligence, something that passes the Turing test, we adopt a much simpler test of what we see as artificial intelligence. And the test is that a computer uh, can basically perform an activity that humans once performed. And from the perspective of a business impact or operating impact of the firm, it's enough that a computer can do that, that it starts to change just about everything. Because all of a sudden the systems are more scalable, the AI can be deployed across a variety of different things and it fundamentally changes the operating model of the firm. 
Our favorite example of AI um, is uh, coming out of, of China. Uh, and this is a, an AI application that is uh, used by JD Digis, which is a financial services firm in China, to uh, enable digital pig insurance. And to provide insurance to pigs, you have to count the pigs, you have to make sure that they are uh, properly identified so that only the right pigs are insured and so on and so forth. And of course, they've developed the simple AI to recognize pigs. And you can see it here in the video, the plus ones are the, are the pigs that are getting counted uh, going from one side of the pig pen to the other. And this very simple system uh, in some ways uh, replaces a completely different organization. I mean, imagine counting pigs by hand and it's, you know, this slide is perfect in, in talking about it. You know, pigs have similar appearance and move around quickly. Uh, large overlapping areas, high breeding density, all these different things. Well, the AI doesn't care, they can recognize it and they can do facial recognition of pigs as well. Pretty amazing, fundamentally changes the way the process works. Uh, another example, uh, interesting one comes out of our own lab. And this is, you've got Kareem on the author list for a JAMA Oncology paper that talks about the recognition of tumor shapes in three dimensions for radiation therapy. And the AI here, uh, with uh, some uh, you know decent algorithm design and some and some great data uh, is replicating and improving on the work of experienced radiologists. Again, relatively simple, major impact. But things get really interesting as you look across the entire economy. There's so many different areas of application, and retail, of course, is one of the primary ones. There's so many different things: market intelligence, forecasting. Uh, chatbots, uh, you know, retail intelligence of all sorts, uh, adaptive learning, IT automation, and so on and on and on. The use cases everywhere. And so much of the stuff is starting to get deployed that it's fundamentally changing the nature of the firm. And that is the basic point of the book, Competing in the Age of AI. It's really brought to life by the story of a company called Ant Financial or the Ant Group right now. The Ant Group starts off as Alipay which is a payment system that spins out of Alibaba uh, in 2013. And Alipay then is used not just to pay, but also to accumulate data. And this data gets merged with other data, turns into a big data platform that is shared across different kinds of businesses. And, and financial continues to uh, create additional businesses. UAVAO is the little sack of gold. It's uh, now the world's largest money market fund, Jima Credit or uh, Credit Sesame uh, in the US is a credit granting uh, firm that is uh, incredibly popular. My bank that can uh, award loans in a very short uh, period of time, it essentially takes three minutes to do an application, which you can do 24 seven. It takes one second for the application to be granted or denied and all this with zero human intervention. And so on and so forth. Ant becomes one of the financial darlings over the last few years. It's poised uh, to go public. And then uh, some interesting things happen. But before we get there, uh, how does Ant manage to do this? Well, firms like uh, Ant Financial can scale so quickly and can do so many different things because fundamentally they work very differently from traditional firms. Their business model and their operating model is very different. Um, so the business model is essentially what the company or what the business is designed to do, like how it creates value, the value proposition, if you like that, uh, or the value capture system, the pricing, the business model, and so on. The operating model uh, is how it delivers all of that. So it's all the hard things that uh, you know all of you uh, do every day. It's like, what do we do to actually make sure that the retail system is actually working? Well, we have a big operating model with people, with technology capabilities, and that operating model is designed to deliver scale, scope, so variety, and it's delivered to do those things and, and change according to the nature of the customers, according to the nature of the innovation needed and so on. So scale, scope, and learning are fundamentally the, the drivers uh, of the operating model. And as we see, digital companies like Ant uh, do this in a fundamentally different way. Since they move people off of the critical path of delivery, there is no human being out there deciding whether or not the customer gets credit or not. Um, there is essentially almost a, no marginal cost to that endeavor and almost no limit to the scalability of that model. By removing the human beings from the bottlenecks, from the operational bottlenecks, from the critical path 
of service delivery, you make the system infinitely scalable. And so, yes, there are people at Ant Financial, not as many as you would have at Bank of America, but there are people there. And But what they do is different. They design, they oversee, they control, they manage risk, uh, all those really important functions, but they're not in the critical path. And so you can increase the scale. Uh, and uh, you just add more computing machines and here you go. Uh, and it's something that is really quite interesting. Satya Nadella says this very well when he talks about AI being the new runtime that is gonna shape all that we do and essentially the operating model of firms, right? So the bottleneck, you digitize that, all of a sudden the scalability goes to the roof. Uh, you can have all kinds of scope because essentially with a digital system, if you design it well, it will be broadly accessible, well architected, have APIs that can expand out to the world that enable complementary services. So lots of variety. Uh, and lots of learning because uh, with AI, you can do local personalization. It's more, it's like you can learn on the fly. Every customer gets his or her own individual uh, personalized operating model, if you like. It's essentially a zero marginal cost. Very powerful, very powerful model. So across the board, we're seeing a fundamental transition uh, in how the economy works. We have digital businesses with an operating model that's founded on software, AI, data, APIs, and so forth, that are colliding with firms that are built in a very in a much more traditional way with your traditional siloed operating model, lots of managers and people around the company doing various things. And we can see this collision between two different models going after the same consumer, say, and financial and HSBC going after essentially the same kinds of uh, use cases, but in a fundamentally different way. Uh, Marriott versus Airbnb, Ford versus Waymo, and Uber to some extent, even, right? Uh, Merca Moderna is, we'll see, two very different firms doing vaccine developments in fundamentally different ways. Fascinating. So as you do all this, great scale, scope, and learning, all kinds of great possibilities, well, as we now know very well, there are challenges as well. There are challenges in cybersecurity, in privacy and bias that are really changing fundamentally uh, what managers and boards uh, need to know about these days. And so all of this digital transformation is not only creating opportunities, but also creating challenges that we need to be better at solving uh, and all kinds of things. And in fact, you can see it with the Ant Group poised for uh, one of 2020's biggest IPOs until the government of China decided against it. And basically now they shut this thing down and they're doing all kinds of changes. The CEO just left uh, all kinds of worries around privacy, around bias, around how is this thing gonna work and compete with the traditional Chinese banks and so on and so forth. And it's just this fascinating story of this transformation going on. So these digital firms are changing the world. And uh, as we'll see in a minute, other firms are adopting the same model as well through transformation. At the same time, not only is there this great upside for doing this well, there's also this need to be much more thoughtful and careful about all kinds of different policy and equity related issues to make sure that these models can really sustain themselves in a way that does not harm the rest of the economy. Now, all this was a nice story until the pandemic hit. Now with the pandemic, Digital transformation is no longer an option. We see here in just a couple of weeks, Kings County, New York, uh, March uh, of 2020, uh, the mobility, the average mobility of the people went down drastically, people went home, work became virtual, and uh, county after county, the world changed literally overnight. In two weeks, basically, uh, the world changed to a much more virtual experience. And you felt it. Uh, like crazy in the retail environment because like we're totally frontline for all of this stuff, uh, for all these changes that are going on. We see changes in a company like Moderna that uh, does biotechnology and it's a vaccine development company, but it's built uh, like a software company. It's basically an end financial of uh, medicine and vaccine development and other kind of therapeutics. Fundamentally, it's built on a digital platform. It all runs on a single data lake and single system of record for uh, all of its systems, runs R&D, runs supply chain, runs HR, whatever you want. And Stefan Bansell, who is the CEO, is a huge fan of the digital model. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you have the Mass General Hospital, uh, where you, know, you see a 210-year-old institution that is going through all this change uh, in fighting the pandemic. 
uh, and doing amazing things. And of course, they don't have the level of sophisticated, beautiful, shiny technology that Moderna might have. They do it with the older system, but still they have an integrated infrastructure. They're pulling in data from different systems that create an integrated data platform and using that uh, over the last year very successfully to predict demand, to predict uh, uh, all kinds of uh, different uh, critical resources, uh, PPE and, and masks and, and, uh, and respirators and things like that. Uh, very exciting stuff going on there. Uh, in retail, you see it everywhere. Uh, Ikea had to shift overnight to a very uh, retail, physical retail intensive model to a fully online model. And then now it's gone hybrid. But literally they took projects that have been working on for years. Uh, Barbara Martin Coppola had all these things on the back burner. All of a sudden it's like, we need this like tomorrow. And so basically in two weeks, they deploy all kinds of things uh, to integrate their digital online assets, to, to build recommendation engines, to provide AI to actually shape customer purchases and essentially really uh, did an incredible job uh, of sustaining and accelerating the digital transformation through the pandemic. Now we did a lot of research on this and what we've seen across more than 130 companies is that what it really takes for a traditional firm to transform is a very holistic process. It's not just about technology. In fact, that uh, we don't see correlations between tech budgets and performance. So some people spend a lot, get very little. Some people uh, spend uh, very little and get very much. And why? And the reason is it takes more than just technology to make a difference. It, the, it, the transformation is largely about architecture, right? You want to architect your organization as a digital platform, essentially. You want the data assets to be integrated and you want, uh, you want them to be carefully protected and designed. You want software to be built in building blocks that you can leverage in various ways. And you wanna release the third factor, which is the people, the innovation process that in the best companies comes from within where their own workforce is passionate about driving digital innovation and will take the software and the data that is exposed to them by the architecture and drive all kinds of new and, and creative things. And this is how you get to the thousands of use cases enabled by digital transformation and AI that you see in a company like Ant Financial, right? Uh, it's not about the IT department, it's about everybody else pulling as much technology as they can uh, to drive business impact with the aid of IT, with the aid of analytics people, with the aid of data scientists and so on. As people grow in this transformation, we see them across different phases from traditional companies that are siloed organization, siloed data to uh, much more advanced uh, sort of hub and platform style companies that really begin to integrate their data assets, integrate their functionality, uh, integrate their software building blocks to build essentially an innovation platform to go out there and enable as many use cases as you want. And they're getting pretty close to real digital native companies. Uh, and by the way, digital native companies themselves, like the Ubers and the Facebooks of the world, also have a lot to learn as they get beyond sort of some of their initial uh, challenges and mistakes and problems to build more secure systems, more private systems, deal with things like algorithmic bias and so on and so forth. So if you look at the full sample uh, that we have in this research, you see all kinds of different people there. We measured at different stages. And when I do this work with Keystown, uh, they're all over this and sort of going in depth on the individual organization and understand where they are and understand where they need to go. Uh, this is the plot of the data that we have out of the retail sector alone. These are all different retailers, anonymized. Uh, and uh, they're spread across uh, a variety of different uh, stages of transformation. There are some that are still very much in the traditional phase, uh, usually due to uh, common stories, many acquisitions, assets separated in different systems, data is not integrated. There's a lot of work to be done. And then gradually starting to bridge between these separate groups, develop these data hubs, uh, integrated data catalogs and infrastructure, and then driving themselves into much more of an actual platform and driving real innovation. So we see uh, this is across both dimensions of sort of the capability that the team's human capability involved in the architecture. Um, 
some quick reflections, uh, and we can go into uh, into more the, with the questions. But the world is obviously going through a major transition. We see this. Digital native companies have shown us a new model. It's not a perfect model. There's a lot to work on there as well, but it's certainly an interesting model. And I think the retail industry as a whole is making progress. Now, that progress is not uniform. Uh, you have some laggards and you have some uh, leaders. And the, uh, But overall, everybody's investing in data analytics uh, experimentation to drive as much personalization as possible. Uh, and traditional firms are uh, really scaling up their investments, not only in the technology itself, but also in training and capability building, because you've got to really change the mindset and the culture of a much broader organization to have an impact. And so in going forward, uh, we need to really continue this and continue to build on these investments and maintain the progress that we made during the pandemic and extend it to turn ourselves into systems with you know, sustainable and thoughtful business and digital transformation going forward. So thank you very much and I look forward to your questions.